Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. My name is Matt Hines, coming to you live uh, from, this isn't Hines Marketing Headquarters, this is just the basement of my house today, um, but this is how we get to work now. Jamie's stuck in Canada for forever, we'll get to that. But thank you very much for joining us uh, for another episode. If you are watching us live on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, all the channels, thanks so much for joining us in the middle of your work day. If you're watching this on demand, uh, thanks very much for catching up with us. Uh, all of our episodes from the last couple months as we've transitioned to this LinkedIn Live format available on demand LinkedIn Live. Uh, also, every episode of, high, of uh, Sales Pipeline Radio uh, in audio format still available past, present, and future on salespipelineradio.com. Check them out. Um, and if you are watching us live on LinkedIn today, we will be watching the comments. If you have questions for our guests today, questions on the topics, even comments um, if you if you want to compliment our, our guest hair, he, those are the things that we can put right up. Those those go right to the front of the line. So if you want to put those in there, we've got you there as well. Want to quickly thank our sponsor for Sales Pipeline Radio. Very excited to have Vidyard uh, joining us as a sponsor this summer. Uh, another Canadian company. It's Canada Day on Sales Pipeline Radio, Jamie. Uh, Vidyard for those that aren't yet using it. It's an easy to use video solution, making it easy to create videos, host them ad free, share them with others, track their performance. Uh, we are a Vidyard customer ourselves. My assistant is a Vidyard power user. She no longer sends written emails. She sends videos explaining things. It works way better. Um, lots of great integrations with other enterprise tools you use as well. Check them out, vidyard.com slash pipeline, and you can get a free high conversion virtual sales playbook. So thanks again to our sponsor, Vidyard. Uh, today, very excited to have so we're, we're going to get into a little origin story because whenever I think Jamie Shanks, I think cocktails in Dallas and we'll get there too. But Jamie Shanks, CEO of Sales for Life, also now CEO of Pipeline Signals. Jamie, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And there are a lot worse places to be trapped in the world than Canada. There, hey, listen, and you mentioned so. I mean, you literally have been spending the last year and a half at your cottage, where you know, with good Wi-Fi, you can pretty much do the same thing as we can all do from anywhere. Uh, pretty awesome. But um, I mean, so let's start with there. I mean, like the last year and a half, a little different. You're a guy who every time I would see you on social, you're in a different part of the world, not just the country. Sort of, you know, when lots of people say that they were the founder of and you know, sort of, you know, godfather of social selling, you were there at the start. I'm giving you that credit. Um, but um. What's the last year and a half been like for you uh, navigating through this with your family and your business? Well, just to give your listeners some context, for five years in a row, uh, before the pandemic, I was on 80 flights a year and I, 44 countries around the world. And we you know, pioneered or either pirated the word social selling and have the global kind of curriculum and training on that topic. And so... I remember we were skiing in British Columbia and the pandemic hit the shores of North America and it kicked everyone who was skiing around North America off the ski hills, basically on the same day. And so we had to fly home and I live in Toronto, Canada. So on the East coast, we were on the flight home and I turned to my wife and I said, why are we going back to our city house when we're trying to avoid people? Why don't we go up to the cottage for a weekend? And now 18 months later, I'm still at the cottage. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? It's it's not a bad thing. And I think in business and life, um, you know, it it's, you know, the, certainly, you know, we wish that we wouldn't have the economic and health impact that COVID has had, but it's not very often we get to control alt delete on our lives and sort of really have an opportunity to reset. And as we come back out of it in whatever that fashion looks like to decide what you want to let back in, to decide what the priorities are moving forward. Um, I know, I think we were talking before they started the show. I mean, you and I are similar, similar boats, have traveled a lot, have families, have other things that are priorities. And coming out of this just gives you an opportunity to say, what's most important? What, what do you really want to spend your time, time and place? What do you want to spend your time doing? Well, yeah, and I heard my son kind of mutter something to a friend up at the cottage about six months in, and it really hit a chord with me. He didn't realize I was standing there, but he said, I didn't really know my daddy before. My son's eight. I didn't really know my daddy because think about it, that's five years of his eight year life. I traveled, but he said, you know, I love having him around. And in that time frame, uh, my son went from never water skiing to now a competitive water skier who has his first competition next weekend. Wow. And those are just some of the little things where it gave me an opportunity. Yes, I'm still pounding out 12 hour days five and a half days a week. But in between calls, I step on the boat, take the kids skiing. Like I get to do things that I 
uh, the work-life intersect that I have now, I'm not going to trade back for the road. Yeah. 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 Well, um, good for you and congratulations on that. I think, you know, there's, you know, there's certainly things you give up, you know, when you don't, you know, eventually get back on a plane. Or if you say, listen, I'm working 12 hours. I want to work nine. I want to work eight. I want to work something normal so I can have more of that time for myself or my family. When you say no to that work, you say yes to something else. You know, when you say yes to that time with your kids on the boat, that time with your kids at the cottage, you know, you are, you're saying no to something else as well. And I think that that trade-off, I don't know. I mean, like there, there's, there's money to be had on the road, but you know, what's it worth for your, to, 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 to spend that time with your son and to have that time with the people that mean the most to you. So not, you know, I know we got a lot to cover today, but um, just, and it, it's, and if, you know, for me, it's still a journey, still figuring that out, but you know, I'm thankful for the reset. Thankful for the opportunity to, to rethink. I was able to quantify it. So my speaking engagement side. So if you look at sales for life's revenue line item, we did a quarter million dollars a year in speaking uh, mm -hmm. and workshops a year. So it was 10% of our revenue. And so, yeah, 10% of any company's revenue is a bit of a line item. But, and we're going to get into this. What spun out of that was we developed a second company. Mm -hmm. We re-engineered all of our people process and technology. Like we were able to work on our business in ways I hadn't been able to in five years because I was gone. Talking today is Pipeline on Radio with Jamie Shanks. He's the founder and CEO of Sales for Life. And okay, we don't have to argue about who created social selling because probably no one did. But you know, you have been there since the beginning, and, and I think we're really one of the sort of we're the in, the starting evangelists of the category. You wrote the book Social Selling Mastery, um, and and have 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 created a lot of what have become sort of best practices and quite frankly table stakes for modern uh, digital sellers. Um, I remember, I think we were talking about this back at that, you know, that co cocktail table in Dallas that, you know, social selling was kind of a big deal, but I felt like it was going to reach a point of maturity when we really stopped calling it social selling and just, it was just part of digital selling. I feel like we have made more of that migration. I think ABM is now kind of in that same kind of weird place. Talk about what you have seen on the front lines, like how, how has social selling evolved and matured as part of selling in general? Yeah, and so my average buyer was the chief revenue officer, head of sales enablement, head of sales ops. And when when we kind of pioneered this word social selling, we'll call it from the years 2012 to 2017, every demo, every discovery call was a why. Why why would I do this? Why should mm -hmm. I evolve? Then also at the as LinkedIn Sales Navigator became a primary tool within the tech stack of sales teams. We started to notice a bit of a, an inflection point where companies were now hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars deep in a tool like this, but now their utilization rates were poor. Sellers didn't really know how to leverage it with any sort of performance. Mm -hmm. So where it was now moving into the, the how. And in the last two years or so since COVID, any company who four years ago told us, you know what? that's a nice to have. Don't think we need to shift. We started getting calls like this overnight saying, Oh my God, my sellers haven't created a lead in 60 days, 90 days, 180 days. They don't know how to fish because the skill of fishing was, you know, BDR would pump them a meeting. AE would fly in, do their demo. That whole model just got broken. Uh, we need a, a whole new go to market on, sales generated pipeline at scale. Mm -hmm. And so recently it's very much that, well, a lot of sales organizations took their field sellers and just turned them into BDRs overnight out of happenstance of the reality of COVID. Those people um, do not have the skills and capabilities to drive sales pipeline. So that the biggest stick, the biggest change to answer your question in a long winded way, no one's even calling it social selling or virtual or digital or modern selling anymore. They're, they're looking at the root problem. The root problem is my sellers are not sales or self-generating their own pipeline. Yeah. And I need to fix it. Yeah. And the answer isn't necessarily like give them more phone numbers to call and just sort of do more activities. Because I think, you know, you can get anybody to come in and just do more activities, like make the activity number look good. But like, who are you calling? Who are you talking to? What conversation are you having? And why are you having that today versus last week versus next week? So how has the... So for, I guess, a couple, couple of questions coming out of that, like how important is sort of process and systems to make, you know, sort of self-prospecting, self-pipeline self production successful for reps today? 
So over eight years, we ended up certifying a quarter million sellers. To become certified in our program, it's a simple process. It's a business case where a seller learns these skills and then they have to apply it in market where they select, plan, engage, and create a real life opportunity and then defend it in a video case study and then document their journey. So when you start reverse engineering a quarter million opportunities created, you start to notice there's patterns. The pattern that started to form was primarily most of the opportunities created had what's called a signal attached to it. And the signals came in three categories. There was either buying intent, there was greater workload consumption or product usage, or there was compelling events. So compelling events have three subcategories. There is a relationship roadmap, you know, advocate goes from company A to company B. There is a time and maturity event, company raises capital, there's a new CISO put in place, a uh, company doubles their marketing department, and then there's competitive intelligence, which is almost like the inverse. You're talking about yellow flags and red flags now. So not just looking at where should I spend my time, but where maybe do I mitigate my risk? And so where are do our competitors have asymmetrical competitive advantages? A lot of that data sits in tools like LinkedIn. There's other tools like Built With and so forth that was giving sellers in the public domain the information to make informed decisions. And so that's the process is understanding. It's a, it's a mindset shift, of course, first, but it's the process of mining that intelligence that aids the seller in account selection and prioritization. Well, it's more than just having that as a function of personalizing your follow-up, I think. You know, it's, it kind of changes the entire paradigm of what makes for a good lead. We don't need people to fill out forms to become a good lead. You can say, I know what companies I should be selling to. I know the people I should be talking to. How do I find and ma manufacture or find and then leverage and follow up with those right intent signals? So, I mean, what's interesting is this conversation is like marketers are having this every day. Like marketers that are doing account-based marketing or just doing Doing sort of modern intent-based selling are using tools like six cents and demand base and others to improve the discipline and precision of their marketing and i'm even seeing companies that are say, taking tools like six cents and saying okay now let's apply this purely to our sales team let's give the sales team you know linkedin sales navigator you know six zoom in for intent sir. signals yeah. yeah these signals um and so to be able to use that on the sales side like talk a little bit about you know what you're seeing in terms of productivity and output improvements from those that are just smiling and dialing versus you know organizations and sellers that are using signals now yeah so if i'm a seller i have what's called a market or a total addressable market and inside my basket is it's primarily broken up three different ways i either have a geographic focus i have a verticalized focus or they've given me named accounts because these are big, sexy logos that I need to focus on. So what, however that's being segmented, let's assume that that's more than three accounts. Let's call that 25, 50, 100. Time is my biggest Achilles heel, or it could be my competitive advantage. And this is a great study done by Topo. Uh, of the 50% of sellers that don't make their quota, you could say that 83.4% of those sellers not making quota, it's because of poor time management. Mm -hmm. So if you look deeper into that, what's happening is sellers have a basket. They have a choice, 50 accounts. Where do I focus my time? And if I spent that calling H1 once a day, 50 days, call them A through Z, call them by color codes, like that's not, that's not a strategy. And so what buying intent has done is helped. It's a piece to a puzzle. It's helped the seller segment their accounts based on order of operations. If I'm going to look at those 50 accounts and figure out what are the five I should really focus in on, who are the ones that are raising their hand, Googling the right words, have people interested in what we're saying. So that's an incredible data set. The challenge is inside your buyer or known as your ICP, that might be one person of 10 that make up the buying committee. So what we're also looking at is the flip side of that called the compelling event. What are the macro and micro things happening to the people within that business that are changing priorities in that business? And that's typically tied to human capital. People make priorities, right? People bring priorities with them into a new business. They take them when they leave. They grow departments. They deploy capital is a, is a leading indicator to the way that they prioritize things in a business. Like if I doubled my marketing department, obviously the company is prioritizing marketing. 
So right. it's complementing buying intent intelligence with compelling event intelligence to help the seller, again, fill in puzzle pieces as to where to spend their time. And to do that consistently, to do that at scale, like it's one thing to say, hey, listen, I'm going to go do a search on LinkedIn and look for certain signals that I feel like I can follow up with. But to have like, let's say you've got 20 sellers and you want them to be doing this on a regular basis. I'm giving you a softball here, Jamie, for pipeline signals, because I think it's a smart way of taking saying like, okay, we've got this training and certification program to help organizations understand why they should be doing this and understand like where to look for it is a whole nother thing to say like where do i get all this like where do i get these signals how do i make sure i'm feeding my organization with the grist for this mill uh to make it successful so talk a little bit about why sort of how that works and sort of the origin story then of of pipeline signals which looks like is like what's pretty shiny brand new like two months or two months old or so right yeah so this is like when i was a kid i used to watch my parents play lob ball and law balls were like they throw the ball way up in the air, and then the batter just has to like hit a ball that's basically dropping out of the sky. So thank you, you just threw me a law ball. <laughs> so um, he, essentially, what we were watching for eight years as a training company is we were giving people the skills to monitor their own total addressable market for these compelling events. Challenge: If I am the head of sales operations or marketing operations. And I noticed that I do not have 100% utilization of my LinkedIn Navigator account. I have a kink in the armor. That means that portions of my TAM are not being monitored. So when COVID happened, my business partner, Amar, and I looked at Sales for Life and we said, we want to launch other businesses. There's a managed service here. And so why we created it is your sales team, your, as your audience's sales teams, you're not paying sellers to be researchers. You're paying for outcomes. But research is a byproduct of what is necessary to make informed decisions. So all that we did was create a managed service that does this with and on behalf of your team. So your team draws a box around what its total addressable market is. That could be geographic, could be named accounts, verticalized, or a, a very specific list of accounts. And we are become you. We, mm-hmm. we partner to drop in to LinkedIn to identify signals in those accounts and then partner with your sellers um, in a workflow, primarily that workflows through your own CRM, to say, here is a new chief information security officer. They meet your ideal customer profile, you should be talking to them before your competition. Or somebody just left your best customer in marketing, and they're now the CMO at this company. Wouldn't you wanna know about that and give them a call? And we're doing that as called a global command center. It's every account in the world, that's meaningful to you, you have a centralized system to monitor it all rather than leave it to your sellers to mine that intelligence on on your behalf and hope and pray that they do it. So uh, this may not be a lob ball. This may be hitting the ball for you, but I I think like what you just described, take out, take intent signals out of that equation and add back in just like, you know, appointments and, you know, there's all these companies that are sort of your outsourced BDR, the, your appointment setters. Like I'm hiring a call center to call my prospects and try to set up meetings for my AEs. A meeting in and of itself may not be that interesting. You shoehorn someone into a 30 minute conversation that they did or didn't know that they wanted to have with a topic and, and, and a reason and rationale that may be obtuse at best, as opposed to taking that haystack and finding the needles on a regular basis, right? And teeing up those conversations. Is that, I mean, is this something that can eventually be automated? Is this something that is still, is it still disparate information that is still like needles in a lot of places that, that needs human interaction? Like, where do you think that, that, that opportunity is going yeah so our team this is a service done by Mm -hmm. humans and it's done by humans because it requires context it requires the mining and sifting through this intelligence to determine what year i'll give you an example uh heinz best customer is microsoft in seattle because you live in seattle right what years has microsoft been a customer well who were the people within microsoft or the departments you dealt with if people leave that department where do they go? And then do they meet your future ideal customer profile? Mm-hmm. That requires a partner. And, and so we then become an extension of you as your lead development rep, your business development rep, um, and feed that intelligence to your BDRs, your inside sales teams, your customer success team. Think about upsell, cross-sell, and protecting mm-hmm. the core. Who's going in and out of your customer base every day? Wouldn't you want to know? 
Are they competitors? Are they friends or foe? That's essentially mm-hmm. the way to look at it. Love it. Just a couple more minutes here with our guest today, Jamie Shanks. He's the CEO of Sales for Life, as well as the CEO of the freshly minted Pipeline Signals. Jamie, where can more people learn from the learn from you? I know you've got you know sales uh, social selling mastery. You produce a ton of content on LinkedIn. If people want to learn more about the topics we've covered today, where should they look? Yeah, first place, look up Jamie Shanks. You'll see a guy about as good looking as I am now as a photo on LinkedIn. Connect with him, and and he'll guide you in the right spot. But essentially, my two businesses, one teaches sellers how to fish and one fishes for them. Sales for Life, the fishing company, Sales for Life, fish for you, or pipeline signals uh, for fishing for you. Um, Look up those websites. Happy to help you in any way I can. And um, and we just we serve the sales community. Yeah, love it. Well, Jamie, I miss seeing you out in the world. Um, you know, you uh, it, it's easy to catch Jamie when he's out there. He's always got just a beautiful uh, sport coat and pocket square. One of the best dressed men. And yeah, best dressed hand sitting next to you. No, oh, no, no, no. I look. I, I'm not even wearing a collar right now. So you, you, you're you're up on me again. But it's all good. Miss seeing you, buddy. Thanks so much for joining us today. Awesome. Thanks for the invite. Thanks, everyone, again for joining us. Uh, If you've enjoyed this conversation, if you have someone on your sales team that you think should be watching and listening to this as well, definitely check this out on demand, which will be available as soon as we stop this presentation on LinkedIn. In a couple of days, it'll be up on salespipelineradio.com and where all good podcasts are found. Thanks again to our uh, to our sponsors, Vidyard. Appreciate them being a contributor and a participant in the show. Another Canadian. So Jamie's out out in the sticks in Canada. Vidyard a little further in, like bigger sticks, slightly larger buildings. Still in the sticks, they're in Kitchener. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so vidyard.com slash pipeline. Get a copy of their high conversion virtual sales playbook. Thanks very much for joining. My name is Matt Hines. We'll see you next week on Sales Pipeline Radio.